you for uh, for the Sabbath day that you've given us, and uh, it's such a blessing to to your people to have this time to uh, to rest, to forget about our worries, and to have fellowship with one another. We thank you for that in all of your Torah. We pray that your spirit, your breath, lead us as we study Numbers and also the first letter of John. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. <clears throat> We're on Numbers chapter 23. Verse 1 says, Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Now, if you'll recall, Balaam is a, is a prophet for prophet. Okay? Uh, P-H and then an F. He is a prophet for prophet. And he is here to, uh, Balak paid his way, paid him to come up there and curse Israel. So Balaam says here, build, build these uh, altars, seven altars. Prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me right here. Uh, he, he, uh, Balaam is, is greedily and unashamedly trying to uh, rush to Balak in order to scam a fortune. And he's, he's out to get that fortune. Uh, Elohim has arranged it so that Balaam is not going to be able to do what he wants to do. He's not going to be able to say anything other than what Elohim allows him to say. So Balaam's scam is going to go up in smoke. Now, Balaam, he's telling Balak, make altars and prepare sacrifices. We don't know for sure, but it would seem that this is according to Elohim's command. Um, several things here. First of all, he picked clean animals to do this with. And I think that's what he was told to do. Also to do seven altars and uh, seven rams, seven bulls, and seven is, denotes completeness. So... Uh, so I think that's a, that's a signal, actually, that Balaam is not going to be able to add or detract from what he can say. All right, this is going to be complete. It's going to be, um, it's going to be it. So let's look at the next three verses. And Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps Yahweh will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will, tell, I will tell you. So he went to a bare hill. Now Elohim met Balaam and he said to him, I set up the seven altars and I've offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. So Balaam went off to a secluded area to wait on a message from Elohim. Now we're, we're going to be told in verse 6 that there were many men with them, not just Balaam and Balak. And they're doing a lot here. I mean, doing uh, 14 offerings like that, that's, that's going to be work. Uh, so, once again, that's probably according to instructions from Elohim. <clears throat> um, in verse 4 there, see where he's saying, I've set up. Now, Elohim met Balaam, and Balaam said to Elohim, I've set up seven altars and I've offered up a bull and a ram on each, on each altar. It's almost like he's saying, I did what you told me. That's how I'm reading that. Verses 5 and 6. Then Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and you shall speak thus. So he returned to him and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab. Now, the sacrifices that Balaam and Balak uh, saw or did, um, they spoke of, of, what their, of their lives really being sinful and unworthy of Elohim. So this is kind of a cleansing before that, a sin offering and a guilt offering. <clears throat> the awfulness of their sin is going to be realized before they hear from Elohim. And here Elohim, we see, put a word in Balaam's mouth. Balaam was not going to be able to say anything but this word that Elohim put in his mouth. Verse 7, And he took up his discourse and said, From Aram Balak has brought me, Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. <clears throat> um, okay, then we have seven bulls, 
seven altars, seven rams. There are going to be seven oracles that Balaam is going to speak. All these statements of Balaam are highly dignified and they're sublime. They're absolutely beautiful. And they can be considered direct uh, productions from the, the breath of Elohim. <clears throat> Verses 8 and 9. How shall I curse whom Elohim has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom Yahweh has not denounced? As I see him from the top of the rocks and I look at him from the hills, behold, a people who dwells apart and shall not be reckoned among the nations. <clears throat> Balaam announces uh, that the people blessed by Elohim cannot be cursed by Elohim unless they're denounced by Elohim. Well, they can't be cursed, put it that way, unless they've been denounced by Elohim. The main point of this first oracle is that Israel is unique among the nations. They're different. They're not to be reckoned with all the other nations. They are a distinct and separate people. Verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. You know, Balaam is allowed to view Israel as Elohim views them. Balaam sees its own number as the dust of the ground. And you know what he says there in that last couple phrases, let me die the death of the upright, let my end be like his, be like Israel's. <clears throat> um, does, that, does that look like Balaam says, I wish I were one of them. I think that's what he's saying here. I'd really like to be one of them, one of Israel. To die as they die. Yeah, to die as they die. Uh huh. To be, an heir. Uh, to be an heir. That's how I see it too. And to be blessed. 11 and 12. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and, be and behold, you've actually blessed them. And he answered and said, Must I not be careful to speak? what Yahweh puts in my mouth. Balak is panicking here. He's, uh, he thinks Balaam can command Elohim. This is what he's thinking. No, no, you tell him what to do. No, 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 no. We see, <laughs> Balaam has already learned that that's not how it works. Elohim's taken this opportunity to show Balak and his princes who is in control. It's not Balak and his money. It isn't Balaam with his greed and his parlor tricks. No, they're, they're not in control at all. Verses 13 and 14. Then Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from where you may see them, although you'll only see the extreme end of them and will not see all of them, and curse them for me from there. So he took him to the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. So Balak said, Let's start this over again. Let's try it again. Maybe this place here, okay, this place is the wrong place. That's the, that's the reason. Elohim won't let you curse them from this place. Uh, this man's at war against Elohim, and he's starting to panic here. Now, the place at the top of Pisgah, it might be Mount Nebo, where Moses eventually viewed the promised land, but we don't know for sure. You ever been to Pisgah? Anybody? Me neither. It's hard to tell. Verse 15. And he said to Balak, stand here beside your burnt offering while I meet Yahweh yonder. Now once again, Balaam goes off by himself to receive the word of Elohim. Verses 16 and 17. Then Yahweh met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, return to Balak and thus you shall speak. And he came to him and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering and the leaders of Moab with him. And Balak said to him, What has Yahweh spoken? It was just like before. Uh, the word is spoken to, to Balak in front of a large group of people. It's going to find out what Elohim told Balaam to say. <clears throat> Verses 18 and 19. Then he took up his discourse and said, Arise, O Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. Verse 19, very important. Very important verse. Elohim is not a man that he should lie, 
nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it, make it good? Now, the first oracle dealt with uh, Israel's uniqueness, their special relationship that they have with Elohim. This oracle deals with the uniqueness of Elohim himself. This is not an oracle for Balaam. Keep that in mind. These are the words that Elohim has placed in the mouth of Balaam. These uh, oracles are the very word of the Father himself. This principle, in verse 19, is one of the solid foundations of Scripture. Elohim does not change. His word does not change. Now, if you want to keep track, if you want a little a place in your notebook or in your Bible where you're writing down places where it says in Scripture that Elohim and his word don't change, you might want to write them now because they're coming. That one is one, Numbers 23, 19. Look, uh, number, uh, and once again, it was return to Balak, thus you shall speak. That was it. That's his words. Look at uh, Malachi 3, verse 6. I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. 1 Samuel 15, verse 29. And also the glory of, of Israel will not lie or change his mind. For he's not a man that he should change his mind. He doesn't change his mind. Now, I've had people ask me, well, what about when he said he would destroy Israel? And Moses talked him out of it, so to speak. Um, yeah. You see, we use the term change your mind to be uh, rather flippantly. Okay. Did Elohim ever change his mind about Israel's sin? No, no he never did. Nor how he felt about it, that's right. Nor that he knew they deserved destruction. However, there are times when the prayer of a righteous man is effective, the Father will listen, and he will change his actions in order to display his love and mercy and grace. He will do that. But that doesn't mean he changed his mind. His mind does not change. His actions may change. Like I said, in order to, instead of show his righteous judgment, he may show his grace and mercy. That's a judge's prerogative. <clears throat> Look at Psalm 102, verses 26 and 27. Even they will perish, but you do endure. All of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You'll change them and they'll be changed. But you're the same, and your years will not come to an end. See, he just doesn't change. Our clothes wear out and stuff. I just saw the other day my daughter threw three of my favorite shirts in the trash can. No! <laughs> I drug them out. <laughs> okay, they wore out a little bit. Because a little cigar burn here and there, but it's still good. It's still good. We wear out. Our clothing wears out. Elohim, no, no change. Luke 21, verse 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You know, once again, he also says that heaven and earth will never pass away. But he says, uh, heaven and earth will pass away first before my words do. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Elohim stands forever. Isaiah 46, 10, or starting at verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I'll accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I planned it, surely I will do it. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, back. Oh, yeah, 11. That's pretty powerful when you look at that very last sentence. Yes. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. Yep. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. Um. And, and I think about things that we see in 
ex, in uh, Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation. See how he, everything happened just like he said it would. Just like he said it would. We should have a confidence factor like up to here that what his word is, is truth. Because he's proved it over and over and over again. Excuse me, it's there for everyone to see. It's there for everyone to see. If you, if you see it. Romans 11, verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of Elohim are irrevocable. They don't go back. Matthew 5, 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the Torah until all is accomplished. Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It's, that's in several of the Gospels. <clears throat> Isaiah 51, starting at verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath. For the sky will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. My righteousness shall not wane. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my Torah. Do you want your definition of righteousness again? It's right there. Righteousness, it's those in whose heart is his Torah. Do not fear the reproach of man, neither be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Um, Mark 13, 31. Well, he said it again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 and 36. Thus says Yahweh, who, <clears throat> who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea that its waves roar, the Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel shall also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Excuse me, that's something else that's forever, his people. Hebrews 1.11, starting at verse 11. They will perish, but you remain. They will all become old as a garment, and as a mantle you'll roll them up. As a garment they'll also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. James 1, verse 17. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of Elohim is tested. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he reprove you and you be proved a liar. Hebrews 13, 8, Yeshua Messiah is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. We're not done. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, The words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Yahweh, will keep them. You'll preserve him from this generation forever. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1.25, but the word of Yahweh abides forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. Now, I don't know how many that was. There's more. More than, more than two. Yes, more than two. Balaam said he'll only speak the word of Elohim. Despite himself, he can't say what he wants to say so he can collect his big paycheck. He can't do it. Verse 20, <clears throat> he continues, Behold, I've received a command to bless, and what he has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. Yeah, he's very limited in his abilities as a wizard. Verse 21, 
He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Yahweh his Elohim is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. This one is a little difficult to interpret, this verse is. Now, Balaam is seeing Israel as Elohim sees Israel. He sees them as children of Elohim whose sins have been cast off. That's what he sees here. <clears throat> I think what he's seeing here is prophetic, is the future. That's what I think he's seeing here. Um, look at Psalm 103, starting at verse 8. Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. <clears throat> he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from, from among us. <clears throat> yeah, um, just as a father has compassion on his children, so Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to, his, to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. Yahweh has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless Yahweh, you his messengers, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Now, um, the way I see this right here... Um, this is, a few, this is redeemed Israel he's speaking of. It says, uh, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Yahweh his Elohim is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. And that's Messiah is what it's referring to. Yeah. I think it is prophetic because back in verse 10 he said, let me die as the righteous die. Let me die as the righteous die. Yep. Yep. Because he's seeing this and, and, and he's understanding what he's seeing. That's correct. He's seeing, he understands what he's seeing, and he is seeing the future. Numbers 23, verse 22, Elohim brings them out of Egypt. He is, for them, like the horns of the wild ox. Uh, by the way, if you have a King James, they'll, have, they'll say unicorn. And, you know, uh, what they called a unicorn in 1611 was likely a rhinoceros. So... Anyway, just thought that was interesting. For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what Elohim has done. Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. This oracle announces the death knell of Balak and all those who stand in the way of the people of Elohim. Verse 25, then Balak said to Balaam, do not curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you? Whatever Yahweh speaks, that I must do. Uh, this was the initial deal, remember? Balaam warned Balak early on. He must speak all that Elohim tells him to speak, and he has to speak it all. Now Balaam, he can't stop. Now, he can't stop until he's finished. And he's not finished. Yeah. At this point, is Balak starting to not want to stop telling what he's seeing and whatever? Uh, Balaam, is he not wanting to stop? He wants to keep telling it uh, from what he's seeing. And you think that's possible? I think now he just doesn't have a choice. Well, I know he doesn't have a choice, but you know, he's starting to buy into it, sort of. Sort of. Uh, however, you're going to see still an evil, evil... So, no, I don't think he really wants to, he, he doesn't want to uh, bless them. He's doing this out of pure, he may have been angry in doing it. Not that it matters. Yeah. 
Verses 27 and 28. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come, I'll take you to another place. Perhaps it'll be more agreeable with Elohim that you curse them for me from there. <clears throat> so Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. Balak's desperate. He thinks that overlooking the people from a different angle may help Balaam curse the enemies of Balak. Verses 29 and 30, And Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here. Prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. And Balak did just as Balaam said and offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Uh, Balak is willing to pay for sorcery, pay a large portion of his kingdom to a charlatan, and do almost anything to prevent his destruction. The one thing he will not do is submit himself to El Shaddai, to the Father. He won't do that. But he'll do anything else. Any, uh, any questions on numbers? This, this continues. It's very interesting how this goes. <clears throat> and uh, Balaam has an answer for Balak after he's done doing these oracles. We're going to go through the oracles, finish them up next time first, and we'll see. Any thoughts, any questions? All right, let's take a break for about five minutes. Then we're going to go over a chapter in 1 John. It's chapter 2, and it is one of the most basic sets of truth for the person who is following the Father that you're going to find. And we'll, uh, it's another note taker. You might want to take, the, it's going to be a, the, uh, you know, I need to write, remember the book of lists? They used to have the book of lists. I read it when I was a kid, loved it. Uh, it'd say 10 fastest animals in the world and they'd list them. Uh, it, it, just a bunch of lists of things. And, and fascinated uh, young men and boys. Uh, it's kind of like Guinness Book of World Records, only it was a book of lists. And I, uh, I love that. You could almost do this with Scripture. Uh, where does Scripture say Elohim doesn't change? Where does Scripture say um, His Word doesn't change? Where does uh, Scripture say the identity of Messiah? Just a listing of things. <laughs> well, that listing of things is going to continue here in just a minute. So we'll be right back in about five minutes.